So, thanks for coming. Today, my, my, my intention is, is to not talk at great length, but rather to get through all the demonstrations. But I need to put them in context and make them sure that you understand what they're showing and why. So let me sort of set the context again uh, where I sort of left off. I talked last week about how elect electric charge works and, and about electricity. Um, so either world electri electricity and electric charge. Then I talked about household magnets and sort of the world of, of magnetic pole and <coughs> magnetism in general. If nothing is moving or changing with time, if you just have electric charges sitting there, they push on each other. Yeah, that's interesting and sometimes fun. And magnets, if nothing, nothing's moving or changing, Magnet, magnets, magnetic poles push on each other, and that's kind of fun too. There's a little bit of difference in that we've got free magnetic, sorry, free electric charge around. Uh, we do not have free magnetic pole around. There are no monopoles, so it's a little more, it's a little more um, subdued what's available in magnetism. But um, they sort of parallel stories, and it's, they seem to have no relationship to each other. And so that's that's where I, where I wanted to go to start with here. Electricity and magnetism initially seemed like two separate phenomena. Well, at the end of last time, Wednesday, I showed you that they're not as separate as they initially appeared. I started showing you electromagnets. Uh, the observation is that if you have electric charge moving as a current, so a current electric, uh, uh, electric current, it's magnetic. And this was discovered, what, 1820? By Ersted, I mean, I'm, I'm a terrible um, historian of science, but but this was this was one of these jaw-dropping moments where he was he was giving a talk and and observed that the current in a wire was affecting a compass, and up until then, no one had ever seen a relationship between electricity and magnetism. This was it. Uh, immediately thereafter, Ampere uh, started developing theory around this, and so that, you know it was it was just one of these watershed moments when suddenly people started realizing that that. Electricity and magnetism are much more interesting and complicated than people had thought, and definitely interrelated. So we have it sort of at this point, the observation that electricity and magnetism are not entirely separate. And what I wanted to show you is this slide. I'm not not a big one, big fan of showing slides, but here is here's, here is a slide. Um, so the, the world of, of mag magnetism and magnetic fields. And really, the heart of magnetism is, is the concept of a magnetic field. It might seem that that's derivative and that magnetic poles are more interesting, but actually the, the fields are more interesting than poles. So the magnetic fields are produced by various things. Electric fields are produced by various things. Again, electric fields turn out to be the more important thing than the electric charge to some extent. So, so um, just in the household magnet land, you, you, we, we know that the magnetic fields are produced by magnetic poles. I mean, just you've got, you got a bar magnet, it's, it's got a magnetic field around it. And ultimately, the, the, the origin of that, mag, uh, the, the magnetic character in a bar magnet is, is secretly the, the subatomic particles, particularly electrons. So, so we've got magnetic fields are produced by, well, magnetic poles and subatomic particles. And electric fields are produced by electric charges in subatomic particles, because electric charges come on the subatomic particles. That's where, that's where they show up from. We, we can't make them out of nothing. They show up in this, on the subatomic particles themselves. And what we discovered at the end of last time by, start, by looking at moving electric charges is the magnetic fields are produced by moving electric charges. This is the, sort of the, the first connection between the world of electricity and magnetism. If you run current through a wire, that wire becomes magnetic, develops a magnetic field around it. And so we've managed to make magnetic field with nothing uh, magnetic itself, or, you know, no magnetic poles. Um, in our future, and part of it being the future being today, we'll discover there are a couple other interrelations between electric fields and magnetic fields. Um, the, the most obscure one is this one listed up here. It turns out that a changing electric field, that is sort of you take a, uh, uh, two, two, two wires, connect them to a battery so that you have uh, the two wires are at different voltages, and you 
then take the wires and connect them to the, each other. So this, they're at the same voltage and go back and forth. So you've got a changing electric field. I mean, I'm just make, making an obscure way to make a changing electric field. Or maybe if you just, yeah, th that'll do. There's a magnetic field associated with that changing electric field. It's, this, it's an obscure one. This is one was, was actually predicted before it was observed. Um, it, it, it needed to be there for everything to be sort of symmetric and orderly. But these two are important. We'll, we'll look at these today. Electric fields can be produced without charge. That's a weird one. You can make an electric field by moving a magnetic pole. No charge, just magnetic pole. Or by changing a magnetic field. This, is, the, 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 this was you know, the inner relationship. Now, they're really interwoven. This is... Well, it was, would have certainly been, been shocking to somebody in 1819 or 1820. At this point, it's, it's old hat, and it's physicists and engineers live with this interrelationship between electricity and magnetism all the time. Okay, so I'm going to come back live, get this out of there, because it's not so important right now, but go away. Okay. Household magnets, you actually do use electromagnets. I, let me just r remind you about electromagnets. You run current through wire, it becomes magnetic. Uh, if you want a very strong magnetic field, the, the, the best way to, to sort of boost the magnetic field is to use the, the current's essentially magnetic influence to magnetize a ferromagnetic material, a material like steel. Uh, I, I, I may have implied that steel is the, and iron and steel are the only sort of magnetic thing in our world. Nickel, cobalt are also ferromagnetic materials. That is, they, they have the magnetic domains, the, that whole story. You can, you can magnetize them by bringing up a strong magnetic pole. If you had a nickel refrigerator, you could stick refrigerator magnets on it. A cobalt refrigerator, same thing. Nickel and cobalt happen to be very ex uh, relatively rare metals, relatively expensive metals with limited supply, and during your lifetime, these both may be uh, issues. Um, uh, cobalt and nickel are actually both used in stainless steel. The odd thing is you bring together stainless, you bring together three elements that are ferromagnetic on their own, that is, they have the magnetic domain structure. Nickel, cobalt, iron, you mix them together in the right proportion, you get lovely stainless steel that's non-magnetic. But it's a long story, that one. Okay. So um, there are gadolidium, too. There are a couple of other ferromagnetic materials. And then as you get colder, you can get a couple more. Anyhow, household magnets, you occasionally have electromagnets in your house. Uh, they, 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 they show up uh, most commonly in valves, in electrically controlled valves of, of, of things like your, your uh, washing machine. You know, how does it manage to turn the water on and off? It's typically using electric currents to magnetize a chunk of, of iron and attract something and make things move. Open the valve, close the valve, that kind of thing. So, so they're around in your everyday life. That's the story of electromagnets. OK, new context now to start looking at the bigger interrelationships between electricity and magnetism. And the context that, that, that I picked out long ago and that I still, still use because it's so important is electric power distribution. It turns out that the power comes to us in a complicated form known as alternating current for reasons having to do with the relationship between electricity and magnetism. And I'll, and I'll, I'll do the whole story behind this uh, probably next Monday and show you the, the problem. 1860s, 70s, uh, people were trying to, just, to, to deliver electric power and use it. And, it. and there was a competition, in effect, between Edison, the, you know, the, the familiar Edison, Thomas Edison, and, and his, his team of people working with power as we've seen, electric, electric currents and power as we've seen them at this point, the, the world of essentially of batteries and things like batteries, where the current goes, arrives at your house, for example, coming through one wire every time at high voltage. It goes through your lamps, your light bulbs, newly invented, and goes back to the electric power company through the second wire at low voltage. That's very sort of simple and straightforward, the world of flashlights, the world of, of ordinary um, battery-powered electric circuits. And here along came another group, another team, um, George Westinghouse, who was wealthy for having invented 
brakes for trains. Um, George Westinghouse and Nikola Tesla started to work on a different kind of electric power distribution, one that seems to make no sense. Electric power distribution where you've got two wires coming to your house, but they, all, they, they, they alternate which one is the high voltage and which one is the lower voltage, and they do it fast. So that at any, if you take a flash photograph, one, one's high voltage, one's low voltage, and then a moment later, you take another flash photograph, they reversed. The, the, the initial wire was, is now low voltage and the other wire is high voltage. How'd that happen? And why would you ever do that? And actually, there's a moment, in between, there's a moment during, between those two photographs where they had no voltage because they were in the process of switching. Why would you ever do this? It turns out you do this because it makes it possible uh, for electricity and magnetism to, to interact in a, in a very, const not constructive way, because that has a special physics meaning, but to work together so that you can move power between circuits. You can have separate circuits, and the circuits can have different characteristics that we'll, we'll talk about on, you know, mostly not, I'll do that on Monday. But why would you do this? And the reason you do it is this, that if you're trying to deliver electric power in, say, New York City, which is where Edison was working really hard to try to deliver power in New York City, is you get more and more customers hanging on the on the destination wires. You, 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 first, you're, you're, you're using two wires to send power to one customer down there on, on such and such block. And you send them a current through one wire at high voltage and you take it back at low voltage. And there you, they consume, let's say, a certain amount of wattage, electric power, so you have to send one ampere of current. That's all very well. Now you get a second customer, now you have to send two amperes of current through the wire. And then 100 customers, you're now at 100 amperes of current going through the wire. That's a problem. And the reason it's a problem is because the wires are consumers of electric power. And I've, I've made that claim and tried to, to convey it to you. They, they don't carry the current for free. You have to push, and you push by way of a voltage drop. The current enters the wire at higher voltage, then it leaves the wire. And as you try to push more and more current through that wire, as you get more customers, or Edison got more customers, the voltage drop in the wire had to increase to push that larger and larger current. So there's more current flowing, and it's experiencing a bigger voltage drop, which means that every passing coulomb of charge is losing more, more energy than before. So it turns out that as you, as you increase the current in the wire, the power the wire consumes increases as the square of the current. So if you double the current, you, you, the power waste goes up by a factor of four. Well, as it goes higher and higher, first, first off, you're wasting more power, and you're also, the arrival voltage, the voltage that's arriving at the neighborhood, the block that you're sending it to, is getting lower and lower, because it's more and more of it's being chewed up in the process of delivery. And eventually, this whole thing is just falls apart. You just can't do it. You can't send 1,000 amperes through a thin wire every bit of the energy will be consumed in the delivery process. So Edison was trying to, was using fatter and fatter wires. I mean, a solution to this is to use fatter wires, which have less electrical resistance and will carry more current at the same voltage drop. So that was his approach, go to fat wires. Uh, there's another approach. And the other approach is start using higher voltages. The wires are consuming power according to how much current you send, not what voltage the wire has. So if you want to send one ampere of current through a wire of a certain character, you might need one volt of voltage drop between entry and exit. It could enter at 100 volts and leave at 99 volts. Or it could enter at a million volts and leave at 999999 volts. It would have lost one volt either way, because that's what it charges for a current for one ampere of current. There's a difference, though, in the, in the charges that show up at the neighborhood. If they show up at 99 volts, each charge has a small amount of energy available to it, and you can get that energy out lighting a light bulb, and you're done. If it arrives at almost a million volts, it's, every coulomb of charge now has a lot of energy. So you're delivering more energy in the million volt case than you were in the 100 volt case. And you're paying the same energy cost, so the same power, power loss in either case. Um, another way to look at that is you can deliver a thousand watts of electric power as either 
10 amperes of current at 100 volts of, of, of voltage difference, or as 1 1,000th of, of, a, of an ampere at a million volts. So you, if you increase the, the amount of power you deliver is the product of the voltage difference times the current. You can play with the relationship between those, and as long as they multiply out to the same value, you're, you're delivering the same power. So what Tesla and Westinghouse figured out to do is send the power uh, out to the neighborhood, or, or at least whenever you're sending long distances, go to the highest voltage you can deliver with and the, li the littlest current. You, you, you increase the voltage drop and therefore need less current to do the delivery. And because the waste of energy has only to do with the current drop, the current flow, you're using less current, you're wasting less energy in the wires. You okay with that or questions about that idea? You tr you tr replacing the, the relationship. And that's, so that's what we did. That's what we have in our, power, in our, in our system now. The, the, the uh, electric power is sent long distances at very high voltages, it's modest currents. They reduce the current, raise the voltage. The product of the two stays the same. That's the power being delivered. But the waste is smaller. The, the, the challenge comes about because in that you can't deliver electric power to somebody's house at a million volts. They're going to have lightning bolts fly around their house. The electric fields are too strong. So what do you do? You have to move power from the high voltage circuit, like the cross country electric uh, power lines, to a second circuit that carries more current and at lower voltage difference, differences and is therefore suitable for going into somebody's house. And that's what we have in this country, in every, basically every country. They have this whole hierarchy of electric power circuits that move current, they move power between the circuits and each circuit operates at a voltage that makes sense for its, its circumstances. So that's, I, I mean that mostly as just an introduction. We'll do it more carefully down the road. And so you've heard it once, you'll hear it again, okay? So how do you, how do you possibly do that moving of, of electric power from circuit to circuit, essentially through thin air? And that's, that's what we get to play with here. So, so the, the first way of, of demonstrating this let me, let me, let me, you know, got tons of good demonstrations to play with. One of the first ones I guess I can show you is that with the, with the electromagnets I showed you that moving electric charge is uh, magnetic. What I want to show you now is that, that moving magnetic pole is electric. Okay, it's, you know, it's, and so here, this is just a, a uh, bar magnet, it has, no electric charge of any significance. So there's nothing electric seemingly about this. And here I have a, a circuit, you know, the world's simplest circuit. It's a circuit that consists of a coil of wire and little light emitting diodes, two of them. Light emitting diodes, in contrast to light bulbs, only light up when the current goes through them one direction. So this is set up, so when the current goes through the coil of wire, in a, uh, I don't know, clockwise, the green bulb, the green LED will light up. If it goes counterclockwise, the red one will light up. Something like that, okay? But that seems like a pretty stupid circuit. It's a circuit that has a coil of wire, which is a consumer of electric power, and lightning diodes, which are consumers of electric power. Where's the power source? Who in the world is gonna create the voltage rise that, that provides electric power to the lightning diodes, which get a voltage drop? And the answer is, we're gonna move a magnetic field. So I'm gonna take the magnetic field, I will put it in slowly into the coil, and as I take it out, watch what happens to the, to the lamps. Do you, see, do you see the red one light up? If I reverse the magnet and pull the other pull out, the green one lights up. So moving electric fields are magnetic, ah, electric. They create electric fields. We create electric fields without charge. I, I told you that would happen, and sure enough, it's happened, okay? Um, so with that then, I can start playing with more of the, the gadgets. Ah, f first I, wanna, I want to show you that the electric power that's coming into this room is actually this weird alternating current. And again, all, you know, direct current, alternating current. That's DC, AC. What do those mean? Direct current is the current provided by a, a battery, for example. 
A certain wire is always at the higher voltage and the other wire is always at the lower voltage. So current is going out to, for delivery at high voltage, goes through, I don't know, a, your toaster, comes back at low voltage. And it's always the same direction, direct. I don't know what, you know, direct doesn't quite convey that, but it's, that's the idea. Alternating current has that weird reversal. Uh, in this country, the reversals occur every 1 120th of a second so that there are 60 full cycles of send the current out the left wire, bring it back the right wire, and then the reverse. So, so every 60 of a second, we're back where we started where the current's going out the left wire. 120 of a second late, later, it's, it's going out the right wire and so on. Okay? Next, but yeah. All right, to show you that, this is an old fashioned wall wart power supply, which are, have kind of gone the way of the dodo bird, too. I mean, these seem like, they're like revolutions when they appeared 30 years ago, 40 years ago. They're old, old and gone. I'm going to plug it in. It has been set up in a weird way so that what it's going to do you, it would show, for, show you, is the current coming out of the power line is essentially reproduced in going through this device, which is, I gotta make it, set it at the right one. Uh, okay, yeah, it's set, it's set right. Um, I wanna, let me dim the room lights a little. So the current is, is, is arriving, I'm claiming, it's arriving at these two light emitting diodes First through, through what I perceive as the right wire and leaving through the left wire and then, back, and then the reverse, back and forth. And, and you can't tell that very easily right now. Both light emitting diodes are on, that, which is already a little bit strange because I did say that light emitting diodes only carry current one way. And so they're both on. That suggests that they're not on at the same time and somehow the current is going both ways. Well, the way you can see that it's both ways, I think, can you see that? Is this fast enough? You're seeing stripes. Then you need, need to go darker. Yeah. Of the board lights. Can you see? Does, it should look like a dotted line. Alternating: red, green, red, green. Uh, yes, red, green. <laughs> Pick the right colors. Um, you can see sometimes flickers like this if you move your eyes around. You, the currents, are, currents, alternating currents are actually become more visible now um, with the use of light emitting diodes, which, which turn on and off very fast, a you know, millionth of a second. And therefore, if the current reverses, you, they, they blink. And so lots of things in our world with light emitting diodes blink as the current is being turned on or off or reversed and so on. So, so you're okay, you're convinced that the, the current in the electric power line it actually is going back, back and forth. Um, we can fix that with various devices. This, this uh, gadget will, will can, can straighten out the crazy currents so it always goes one direction. I, I, I won't pursue that right now because that's not really the topic at hand. But, but they have that, that current going back and forth, which is already pretty good. Okay. So if I take that current coming out of the power line, which so this is this is plugged into the power line. This is an electromagnet. It consists of, of iron and a coil of wire. And we are going to run current through this coil of wire right from the power company. It's going to go around one way for about a hundred and twentieth of a second. And then for the next hundred and twentieth of a second, it's going to go the other way. So so you're okay with the idea that 60 what we call 60 cycle electric power in this country means that it goes through six, 60 full cycles of reversal every second, which includes both the going one way and the other way. Uh, in Europe and some other countries, it is 50 cycle. It's just subtly different. It has some effects on the equipment, but, but uh, it was just a choice. I don't know when and how the choices were made. So if I make, there's a switch in the circuit, so it's not on all the time. If it's on all the time, it gets pretty hot. So I'm going to turn it on, and it will just buzz. Because there are magnetic forces around. They're pretty strong. 
and they are sort of winking on and off 60 or 120 times a second. And just for fun and games here, if I take a, a, a coil of wire, it's not a very interesting coil of wire, it's just one complete loop, a ring, you know, a giant's ring, you know, you get, get married to a giant. Okay, um, of aluminum. If I put it on here, what's gonna happen? Well, as this coil becomes magnetized first one way and then the other, it's a lot like me waving the magnet around in front of this coil. The coil will start to carry electric current. So, so here's the idea, that rather than wave a magnet near a coil, I'm gonna turn on and off in reverse a magnet near a, nut, near a coil. This coil has only one turn in it. That had a whole lot of turns. It's jargon, but, but a turn is a, is, a, is a complete loop. So there's one complete loop. That one has, I don't know, 10,000 complete loops. And this is gonna have current flow in it. Because if this guy is, the magnetic field around this is, is changing with time, that creates electric fields. And the electric field is arranged such that it pushes charge around that circuit. It's a simple circuit, it's got no obvious power source in it, and yet it's gonna have current flowing in it. It will have an electric field pushing charge around. Okay, electric, cur electric currents are magnetic. The full details of why this happens are, are a little more complicated than that. But we basically have a, a, ma a magnet that's, that's going crazy here. This guy's gonna become a magnet too. And they will re repel each other like this. Mm. Okay, so it's boing, all right. Um, if we take the same ring and cut a little sliver in it, so it's not a complete circuit, it's, this is an open circuit, boring, okay? So it's gotta be a complete circuit. This is copper, and copper by itself is a better conductor, but it's also heavier, so it doesn't jump as well, until you chill it. Uh, it turns out that the electrical resistance of metals decreases with temperature. That is, as you get them colder, their ability to carry electric current in a given, electri in a given electric field gets better. So, so cooling down wires makes them better conductors of electricity. They will charge less voltage, there'll be smaller voltage drops and stuff to get the current going. So I'll, I'll cool both al aluminum and copper. Any excuse for liquid nitrogen is always a good excuse. It's my general rule. Okay, so, so these guys are getting pretty cold. So the result is the aluminum is gonna be able to carry more current than before. It'll become more magnetic than before and it will jump higher than before. Ooh, it's also very cold, okay? But according to Al, I haven't tried this for a while, the copper, uh. <laughs> I, I missed it. I didn't even see it go. Let's try this again. He claims it goes really high. I need to, ready? Uh. <laughs> yeah, almost hit the ceiling. All right. <laughs> Fine, all right. So, Changing magnetic field created by this electromagnet that we are powering with alternating current creates an electric field around this because it's changing magnetism is electric. Ma electric field pushes current in the wire and the current in the wire is effectively magnetic that, that, and, and, it's, and repulsive here. It's a little bit, I'm leaving a little bit of the details under, under uh, control. Okay, but that allows us to do, to do this. This is another seemingly stupid circuit that has no electric power source in it. It's a coil of wire and a light bulb. Where's the power gonna come from? Well, if I put it on this electromagnet, the changing magnetic field will produce an electric field, which will push current in this wire and light the light bulb up. Right. So, we moved electric power through, through air, nothing. It went from this coil to magnetizing this, this chunk of iron back and forth and back and forth 
to this coil. We move power from one electric circuit. This is the circuit that goes to the power company. This doesn't. It's electrically insulated from the power company, and yet power moved from one to the other. This is a transformer. So it, this, this now is what's called a transformer. Actually, I feel a little bit of push up it, it, when yeah. I do that, because the current begins to flow, and the same effect's going on. It's trying to push apart. So this, this moving electric power, any of you who have, I think the most common way in which this works, <sighs> toothbrushes, a lot of cordless toothbrushes, electric toothbrushes, you basically, you got the toothbrush, you got the base, it's basically an electromagnet plugged into the power company, maybe a little bit more complicated than that, and when you put the thing in its base, power moves from one to the other, and they arrange it so the power takes, you know, charges the battery and stuff. Uh, another one is some of you have uh, cordless chargers for cell phones, same idea. They have a coil of wire in the base, the, there's a magnetic field that's going back and forth, and back and forth, and back and forth, which is electric, and you put the phone on it, and currents push back, push around the phone, and, and it charges your phone that way. All right. Make sure I'm not going to leave anything behind. All right. So this is the basic idea behind a transformer. You have two coils of wire in two separate electric circuits, and the magnet, the magnetic, the magnetization that comes from running current back and forth in one of the wires, one of the coils of wire, which is what just to give it a name is called the primary coil usually. Uh, that causes this changing magnetic field um, in the, in the, ar around the transformer, which is itself creates an electric field. And the electric field then pushes on charge in this second coil of wire and gives that moving charge in the second coil of wire, if there is moving charge, gives it energy. Um, and actually that, that the electric field associated with that changing magnetic field has two effects. One is it does work on the charge moving in, in the secondary coil, so it's called. So, so the electric field is pushing on charge in this, in this now secondary coil, that's the primary, and doing work on it. It is also, the electric field is also pushing on the charges in this coil of wire, but against their movement. It's doing negative work on them. It's taking the energy out of them. So energy is, is being moved from this coil, the charges in that coil, to charges in this coil. It all works out, energy is conserved, works out great. Okay? Now, the number of, time, number of times the wire in this secondary coil, I'm using the, the words pretty cavalierly here and jumping into them, primary, secondary, the number of times that the, the coil goes around determines how much work is done on every charge. The more times it goes around, the more work is done on every charge, and therefore it's getting more energy per charge, which is more voltage. So this coil of wire is about correctly matched to this coil of wire, so when this coil of wire has enough negative work done on every Coulomb to use up all its, uh, it, its energy, this one has enough positive work done on it to give it all its energy. They're about evenly matched. So this is, this is, this is being powered by ordinary household electric power, which is delivered 120 volts nominally. That's, that's the claim. It's 120 volts about, or 110, 120, 117. This creates about 117 or, uh, volts of voltage rise. The, the, where I'm trying to go with this is, if you have the same number of, of turns, again, a jargon term that's just widespread, turns in that coil as in this coil, this thing being powered by 120 volt alternating current, which I haven't defined very well yet, becomes essentially 120 volt alternating current in this uh, uh, power in, in this coil. Um, incidentally, what's, what does it mean to have 120 volts of alternating current? Because the voltage is, is going up and down and up and down and up and down. It means that on average, uh, it's, a, it's a more complicated average than just simply averaging over time. On average, the voltage difference between the two wires in a, in a 120 volt alternating current power source is 120 volts. It, it, it delivers the same power to, a, say, a toaster as it would if it were 120 volts of direct current. They're in, they're, it, the toaster can't tell the difference for, for all practical purposes. So the voltage differences between the two, the two ends of the wire powering this are about 120 volts on average. 
uh, using a pro uh, the proper kind of average. If you use different numbers of turns in the primary and secondary coil, you can get interesting effects, however. So, so now let me come over to this transformer and This transformer has two coils in it, one of which goes to the power company, this one. Is that for real? Does, does he actually want that plug in there? Okay, yeah. So I was powering this and the, the two light bulbs from 120 volt power. And this is a separate coil. They're, they're, they're connected only magnetically. This chunk of iron sort of conveys the magnetic uh, effect and magnetic field from one coil to the other coil in much the same way that, that this chunk of iron conveyed it. It's not a, yeah. So now if I turn this on, the light bulbs light. They actually light a little brighter than before because this coil has more turns in it by a factor of two than that, than that coil. The result is the charges go around that secondary coil twice as far and you have twice as much work on, done on them and they, the, the voltage rise in that coil from, from the low voltage end to the high voltage end is actually twice what it, what it, what it is over here. But that's the basic idea. But right, right now, it just doesn't seem to be doing anything interesting except moving electric power from one coil to the other, which is to say from one circuit to a completely separate circuit. Uh, completely separate is actually interesting. If I were a little braver, I would touch the wires here. I'm not quite that brave because I don't know whether everything's all wired up right. But this being a separate circuit doesn't connect with the earth in any, in any way. If I touch one wire here, charge will go on to me, but it doesn't have any way to go over to the low voltage side. It'll come, it'll come on to me at high voltage, and if I were, had some place to, to go at low voltage, it would, and I'd get current through me, and it wouldn't feel good at all, or worse. But because this is not connected to anything, it's just a coil of wire and light bulbs, if I touch one spot on it, Maybe a little charge can go between us, but I, no sustained current can go between us. So this is what's known as an isolation transformer. And they're, they're used in, in places where you want to avoid shocks. Um, medical isolation transformers are around. Anyhow, let me keep going. Let me take apart this transformer. So I take out the chunk of iron, take out the light bulbs and their coil, and I go to this coil, this coil only has a few turns in it. I think he's got the transformer set up so we can, we can look at it up close and personal. <sighs> number two, camera number two. And I'll dim the light one, one notch. So, so I'm gonna put a coil that has only a few turns on it. In the circuit, it, it, as the secondary circuit. So this is a coil now that, that will create a very, yeah, finish it. it, it oh, the charges only make a few turns around, around the, magne, uh, the magnet. Uh, and therefore, don't pick up very much energy per charge. The voltage rise in this, in this coil is small. The voltage rise is called EMF, just to give it a name. The, the, the induced induction is this process of, 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 of the electric field influence that's created by, by mag changing magnetic field. So the charges only pick up a little bit of energy, but we can send a lot of charges through that coil. It's made of heavy wire. As the charges go through it, they pick, each charge doesn't pick up very much energy. We can get lots of charges to flow every second without uh, consuming very much electric power because it's low voltage. A small voltage, to, 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 to convey the same power at, at a much lower voltage, you need many more charges. The point is, the current that flows through this will be enormous. Not yet, because I haven't completed the circuit. I'm about to, here I go. Now I've completed the circuit. Can you see the color change there? One of the nails is now red hot. So this is how welding is done. You can make very, you can use a transformer that's consuming a, 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 a certain amount of electric power 
as a modest current of relatively high volt, with a very little, relatively high voltage drop. It, it is conveyed over to a second circuit in which it's an enormous current with a very small voltage drop. And that huge current, as, as we've talked about, um, the amount of power that a wire or a nail wastes is proportional to the current squared. So this giant current is so much, turns these, these nails into, into huge consumers' electric power and they get red hot. Is that okay? Okay, so that's, that's how you do welding. How about something else that's a little more exciting? So this is a, th this incidentally is what's called a step-down transformer. It has way more turns in the primary than in the secondary. As a result, the secondary, the charges in the secondary circuit only go around a few times. They pick up very little voltage. The voltage rise in this, or, or EMF, in this secondary coil is tiny. However, you can send a lot of charges through it before you have um, taken all the energy out of the, uh, the, the, out of the primary coil. All right, so I'm going to take this out. I'm getting a little uh, terse here. I realize I'm leaving some stuff behind, but can't do it all. Okay, this time I've got a coil as the secondary with lots of turns. I mean, 12,000 or something like that turns. It's labeled somewhere. Oh, 23,000 turns. That means the charges go around and around and around. They're pushed by the electric field many, many, many times. Huge amount of work done on every charge. Therefore, the voltage rise for this is enormous. Enough that you get this. So the voltage rise is so high between, you, know, it, you have to, oh, keep going. At, you know, if you look at one instant in time, we take a flash photograph again. One of the, those, the, the outlets of the wire, the two ends of the wire, one is at low voltage. The other one, be, by virtue of having the, any charge in that coil go around many, many times, is at much higher voltage, 10,000 volts maybe. So this is, about a, this is probably producing 10,000 volt, uh, eight, 11 kilovolts, 11,000 volts. The, 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 uh, the arc instantly rises because of temperature. It's hot air. Hot, hot air rises, right? The issue here is it's actually not a complete circuit until that spark forms. Um, so bef the moment before the spark formed, one of those metal rods was, say, at 11,000 volts, and the other one was at zero volts. And because they're two, a very big voltage difference, very close together, that's a big voltage gradient, which is a big electric field. It's such a big electric field that it just starts tearing the air molecules apart. And so the air molecules uh, break down into pieces that are electrically charged, and you end up with a, with a gas-like medium that is full of electrically charged thingies. And that's just generically called a plasma. So we're making plasma, uh, uh, pl plasma being different from a gas because in, a ga in an or ordinary gas, the little particles that are rattling around don't notice each other except when they touch. They have no long range effect on each other. In a plasma, they do because they're electrically charged. They push on each other at a distance. And so this is a, you know, it's called plasma. Anyhow, once it forms, it rises because it's lighter than air. It goes up, it gets longer. It, it's a good conductor of electricity, as you can see, until finally it gets too long, and then it breaks, and the thing starts over. So that's 11,000 volts, but we can do better. <laughs> All right. Um, this is what's known as a Tesla coil, named after the same Nik Nikola Tesla who, who really pioneered alternating current. It is a transformer also, but it's, a trans it's actually two transformers. It's first a transformer kind of like that, that gets us from, the, from ordinary, the voltages associated with the power line, like 120 volts, gets us up to, I don't know, 10,000 volts. And then it uses that 10,000 volts in a second transformer. It's a transformer that has no, no iron in it anymore, which makes it a little harder to run as a transformer. You have to run it at higher, you have to reverse the magnetic field faster. So it reverses the magnetic field itself using, using spark gaps, which, which is obnoxious. So this is loud, but fun. And the result is you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight turns in the primary coil of the main transformer, and probably 
1,000, 2,000 on the top. And then the ring on top, which has no sharp points because you don't want corona discharges. Remember corona discharges? Same as always. Okay, so I'm going to run the current. Does it go right on without? Maybe just plugging it in is the only switch. I haven't done this guy for a while. Here we go. Let's see what happens. It will be loud if it runs. The electric fields are so strong around this that they push charge around inside the tube and light it up. But you, you can see the sparks coming out, right? The voltage is so high that the voltage gradient between you know, 200,000 volts there and the rest of the room, which is zero volts, the voltage gradient is enough to push charge off that ring and set it up. So I'll do it one more time. Okay. I realize I got the, the, the camera. Other, oh, oh. <laughs> okay, good. Al fixed it. I forget everything about cameras. Anyway, lots of fun. Okay. You, you understand how, vaguely, you know, mostly how this works? It's, it's, it's a transformer and a transformer. It's, a, it's double tra It's three circuits. The power company circuit is delivering, say, one, a uh, one ampere of current at 110 volts between the high voltage and the low voltage. A second transformer takes power out of that circuit. There's about 100 watts of power to work with. Takes power out of that circuit and creates a second uh, system in which power is flowing from a power source, which is the secondary for the first transformer. It's, it's sending that, that power through another transfer, into another transformer as the primary. So the primary of the second transformer is this coil of, of copper here. And finally, the, the third circuit is this coil of wire and the bump at the top and basically the open air of the room. So current is flowing out of the top of this down to the bottom of it somehow and, or vice versa. All right? One more thing to show you before we stop. I know I can't top that directly, but I also want to show you that, that you know, I said moving, moving or changing magnetic fields create electric fields which cause current to flow in, in, in stuff. Well. You might not think of a chunk of iron like that as something that carries current, but it, but it, it, it can. You can get, this can be a circuit, just a chunk of copper. How do you get current flowing in it? You, it needs electric fields. How do you get an electric field in it? Move a magnet near it. So I'm going to move, move magnet. I'm just going to drop the magnet onto it. It drops slowly. Do you see that it's, that's, it's weird? It's not like, well, that's a drop, right? It's not dropping right. As it's descending, the changing, the moving magnetic pole, magnetic field, creates an electric field which causes currents to flow in the chunk of copper. Those currents, currents are magnetic. And they're magnetic, and I'll talk about the, why the direction works out the, this way. They're magnetic such that they repel the descending magnet. So the descending magnet has trouble landing. It also has trouble leaving. It's hard, to, it's hard to pull it away. It's hard to push it toward it. If you come up here and play with this, just bounce it up, gently up and down, you'll feel it fighting you though, every time you try it. Another version is this guy. There's a magnet in between the two. Yeah, <laughs> Al's doing remote control for me. Um, yay. And there it is. OK. And I need to dim the lights one, one notch, I think, yeah. So what you're seeing on the top is these second magnets between these two big chunks of iron. I'm holding that magnet up with, a, with a, the top magnet, the one in my hand. If I pull the magnet in my hand away, it falls. But it doesn't fall instantly. It, it takes time. It is inducing currents. Inducing means that, that changing magnetic influences cause, create electric fields which cause currents to flow. And those currents are magnetic here. They, they make it hard for that poor little magnet to, to, to fall up and down. Ooh. All right, so you can come, come try these guys after class if you've got a moment. All right, thank you for sticking around. And